As you'd expect from the title, Capcom's Monster Hunter franchise is stuffed to the gills with all sorts of exotic beasts. But perhaps the most prevalent in the series run is Rathalos, the flagship of the first two games, the Fire Wyvern, and the King of the Skies. The female of the species is known as a Rathian, noticeable from their green colour and array of toxic quills. The two exhibit a number of interesting behaviours, and numerous questions can be asked from their behavioural ecology from these. Why are the different genders of the same species found in markedly different habitats? Why does Rathalos only tend to a single Rathian despite clearly mating with several? Does Rathalos deserve his title of King of the Skies, and why is Rathian grounded in comparison? Luckily, the Monster Hunter team's attitude to canon, or indeed giving much information at all, makes this franchise ripe for fan speculation and theorising. And in this series, we'll be using the behaviour and ecology of real-world animals to try and explore those of Monster Hunter. Or maybe it's the other way around. But let's begin. To start off, one question about Rathalos is his habit of seemingly mating with multiple Rathian, but only actually tending to one of them. Birds of prey are perhaps the best analogues for the main predatory wyverns in the series, and whilst many are monogamous, there is some variation. Harriers exhibit polygyny, which is the relationship of one male with multiple females. But even then, Rathalos doesn't exhibit true polygyny in the avian sense, in that Rathalos doesn't care for the multiple Rathian he mates with, only one. In birds, raising chicks alone is called monoparental care and doesn't actually seem to occur in the actual brooding of the eggs phase, but only when the chicks have hatched does one adult desert the nest. There is one bird that does something somewhat similar, and it's the largest one alive today, the ostrich. After a spot of courtship, the male builds the female several nests, one of which she accepts and lays her clutch in. This is the major hen, and the one the male has some pair bond with. There are other females too who may have their own nests, but mainly lay in someone else's, that are known as minor hens. So the male does tend to these nests, but only really bonds with one female, seemingly like Rathalos. The reason for this odd mating concept among ostriches can be roughly summarised as a skewed sex ratio, coupled with a high abundance of predators, but productive environments, leading to their major minor breeding system. The latter points at least seem pretty fair for the environments the wyverns in this video feature in. Returning to Rathian and Polygyny for a moment, whilst in other birds the male pair bonds with multiple females, this doesn't mean all of them have an easy time being looked after, because there's competition too among the females themselves. This correlates with information from the Monster Hunter World art book, that Rathians compete for a Rathalos as a mate. But why did this go so extreme that Rathian completely extirpate other females, rather than just staggering their breeding? In certain seabirds, there's a phenomenon called Ashmole's Halo, which is just a dramatic name for the decrease in prey items that occur around breeding seabird colonies, ultimately limiting their size, success, and season. In wyverns as large as Rathalos and Rathian, that for a breeding season would be forced to stay in one area with broods of hungry growing chicks to feed, plus the landscape of fear created by regular predation, it seems likely that this may occur. The hostility in Rathians to their own kind, to the point of extirpation, is likely an evolutionary response in dominant females to favour their own offspring. The distant ancestors of Rathalos were likely around the size of Wingdrakes, and so probably did have bird-like polygyny that ultimately became the unique breeding system it is today through the resource requirements the wyverns needed as they grew into much larger top-order carnivores. So it seems the bizarre mating system is much more driven by Rathian than by Rathalos. Whilst we obviously have no evidence that Rathalos and Rathian have a similarly skewed sex ratio similar to ostriches, but it does seem like another good factor for their odd mating system, considering that without it there wouldn't really be much need for the Rathians to fight. There's still going to be better odds for a female for raising young without a male than by not mating at all, and for Rathalos it's still going to be beneficial for him to mate with as many females as possible, solely to hedge his bets that at least some of them in the other nests will survive, even if he's not the one looking after them. After all, in polygynous harriers, whilst each individual nest is less successful than monogamous ones, more of the chicks make it to adulthood overall for polygynous males. The reason monoparental care is so rare in birds is that they need to incubate their eggs, as wyverns may need to as well, which leads us to our next point in the habitat differences of Rathalos and Rathian. The ideal habitat for this species seems to be a mosaic of deciduous forest and broken hills or wetland, or the coastal forest and floodplain that makes up the bulk of their habitat in the New World. 
This is where the two are most frequently found in breeding pairs, and are the habitats that the two are most typically associated with. But Rathian are also found in both dense tropical rainforest and arid deserts too. This is likely the need for high temperatures to keep eggs warm when she can't brood them herself. In volcanic regions, the ground is confirmed to be too hot due to the close proximity to magma, and in higher altitudes and latitudes it'll be the opposite, and be too cold. But for an unlucky Rathian without a mate, which is the better option? Let's analyse the habitats and take a look. Starting with the rainforest, one thing that stands out about modern habitats is the lack of large predators in them. Indeed, in Monster Hunter as well, there may be animals like Levinus, Devil Joe, and Zenoga that roam in and out of dense rainforests, but the only real resident large carnivore is Naga Cougar. The reason for this is that whilst amazingly biodiverse, rainforests aren't productive in the way more open habitats are. Most of the plant life is toxic, difficult to digest, or low in nutrients on the ground level, with the bulk of the good food being in the canopy layer. Hence why primates like Congolala or Quechua are frequent, as they can actually access it. The rich leaf litter also supports a vast variety of invertebrates, some large enough to support good numbers of bird wyverns like Yan Kutku, and coupled with fallen fruit and fungi, good numbers of suids like Mosswine and Bullfango. These in turn support good packs of raptorial bird wyverns like Velocidrome and Iodrome but very little Aptonoth or the large herbivores Rathian would be dependent on. Whilst they're present in small groups, it's nothing like the massive herds the open plains support. The rest of the animals mentioned can certainly make up part of the diet, but with sharp senses and arboreal abilities, they'd likely be too hard to regularly catch, especially as the thick rainforest vegetation would make ambush difficult from the ground. This is also likely the reason Rathalos never comes to such thick areas like dense rainforests, as it's impossible to fly in the dense canopies and the visibility is low from above. This is a double-edged sword though, with little to attract large predators. For a Rathian that's either successful enough at hunting atypical prey, or manages to get enough large herbivores, it should be able to raise a pretty safe brood of chicks here. Desert regions aren't too dissimilar in that the lack of biomass reduces carnivore densities, but there's a definite argument it's a more dangerous place to rear a brood. Seregios seem to favour arid areas, and as I'll explore in a later video, they may well be the most important nest predator of Rathian. Tigrex also seem to frequent arid areas as they follow Apsaros herds, and either of the Bloss Wyverns are belligerent enough to attack Rathian without actually being carnivorous. Glavinus and Devil Joe also occur here semi-regularly, with the former possibly even being resident. It's hard to say if it has more or less large herbivores than the rainforest, but only likely marginally, and mainly focused around water sources too, so overall it seems to have the cons of the rainforest with none of the pros. Considering a lot of areas like the forest and hills near Kotoko seem to be close to deserts and other arid areas, there may be little reason for Rathian to nest in deserts other than they purely don't have anywhere else to go, and are almost certainly the least successful at raising chicks to adulthood. Reproduction may also answer another question that follows these two wyverns, which is, why does Rathian seemingly spend so much more time on the ground than Rathalos? And the answer may actually be size. According to figures from the World Art Book at least, the largest Rathian is at least partially larger than the largest Rathalos. But length is a pretty poor measure of actual mass, compared to well, actual mass, or weight as it may be called. Often animals that only look marginally larger can be much heavier. In birds of prey, males are actually smaller than the females, who guard the nest and feed the chicks as the male forages for the rest of the family. There are a number of reasons for this, mainly surrounding the fact that his smaller size makes him the far better flyer. It's also suggested that the female's greater bulk helps produce and protect unlaid eggs and incubate them once laid too, which would make sense. Whilst it's unlikely Rathian literally sits on her clutch like a bird, but considering that she can canonically produce up to 10 eggs, that's a pretty significant energy cost to have to fly around with. The greater bulk of female birds also helps them defend the nest. Considering that canonically Rathian will often defend their nests viciously, and the fated tail slap has been described to work on monsters up to the size of a basil juice, it seems there may be some truth in this. Plus, the greater mass of Rathian, the far greater the impact of the hit with this particular move. This likely also explains the poisonous quills Rathian is covered in that are absent in Rathalos which would be a pretty effective deterrent against monsters trying to bite and grapple with her. Whilst Rathalos also does his share, if he isn't around all of the time, then the Rathian needs to be bulky and powerful enough to defend herself. 
Whilst this might lead to selection for bigger females in general, any Rathian who succeeds in getting her own Rathalos effectively gets the deck reshuffled by whatever genes he may also possess. In real life birds, there is also some dietary partitioning between males and females, but I don't see this happening in Wyverns as it seems Rathalos and Rathian take the same prey base. But with that said, it's not just the kill, it's the finding of enough food, the pursuit and the transportation too. Rathalos may overall be more efficient as a forager due to his superior flight capability and so is the better choice to provision the nest. On this note, let's explore some of the more combat and predatory oriented aspects of the two. The analogue I had in mind for Rathalos throughout the making of this video was one of the large open country eagles, something like a golden, martial or wedge-tailed eagle. Looking at the various methods golden eagles use to hunt, I am indeed put in mind of the hunting behaviours seen by Rathalos over the course of the series, especially the high saw with a glide attack method. This also allows Rathalos to kill two birds with one stone, as he can patrol the lands from above, searching for both food and invaders. Considering this and the fiery breath, it's questionable as to why Rathalos also needs venomous talons, and what venom may be used. It's possible this may be vestigial, and that it's more for young Rathalos who are less experienced hunters and so are less likely to get a fatal first strike. In terms of what venom, if we break it down into the three main types of neurotoxin, hemotoxin and cytotoxin, of which myotoxins and necrotoxins would also fall under, we can rule out neurotoxin as this is responsible for paralysis like that exhibited by Gendrome or Great Gyros. Cytotoxins are primarily delivered in large quantities to begin digesting the prey before the snake actually eats it, and for Rathalos with his seemingly large and powerful jaws I feel this would be quite redundant. Therefore I'd suggest a hemotoxin, as this most likely seems to be beneficial, causing prey to not only bleed out quicker but also giving a blood trail to a follow escaped prey on. Much like that of a Komodo dragon, where prey capture is sped up via venom-induced blood loss, this behavioural flexibility of starting out with an eagle-like strike but falling back on Komodo dragon behaviour if the initial attack wasn't fatal, would also make Rathalos a highly successful hunter. Rathian doesn't appear to use her venom to capture prey, and for some time it was believed that this was the chief evolutionary cause of venom. However, recent research into spitting cobras finds that their venom has evolved uniquely to cause as much pain as possible and has evolved directly as a specific anti-predator mechanism, not just as a bonus from prey capture. This seems quite analogous to Rathian, who primarily seems to use her venomous tail sweep in self-defense or that of her nest, which also seems to be the purpose of her quills as well. In cobras, this venom is a cytotoxin, to inflame and degrade the tissues it comes across and works when sprayed in the eyes to the point of causing blindness. When against hunters, Rathian obviously just aims for any part of the body, but a cytotoxin would also fit with the degrading effects of Rathian venom that she actually manages to strike hunters with. When we consider how most terrestrial wyverns who would be attacking Rathian or her nest would likely be leading with their head, a painful strike to the eyes, nose or mouth may still have the potential to not only cause tremendous pain, but also possibly blindness, or great difficulty feeding that could ultimately be fatal. On to Rathalos's title of King of the Skies, I do feel he deserves it. Yes, there are flying animals in the world of Monster Hunter more powerful than him, but these are pretty rare. Basil juice and the various elders live at far lower densities and so seem a lot less present in human cultures. There's a bit of a joke in the fandom that Rathalos always loses to everyone, but this is quite untrue. The only turf wars Rathalos loses is to Devil Joe and Rajang. He ties with most of the monsters he fights and often gives a much better showing too, one could argue. He dodges most of Astalos's edgelord attacks in the opening of Generations in a fight that supposedly ends in a draw, seems overall tied in power with Seregios, and in the fight with Lygiacris in the opening of Tri, it doesn't really happen. I'd also say in his actual turf wars, Rathalos performs very well. He kicks Anjanath's ass, negates Nagakuga's counter-attack, whilst Nagakuga can't really do much to prevent Rathalos's initial assault. And the same with Zenoga too who really quite sucks in his turf wars. I know these are technically draws, but in the same way sporting teams can tie with people generally acknowledging that one of the teams does better, I'd definitely say Rathalos gives a better showing. This isn't to demean the other monsters, who could definitely take down a Rathalos, especially a grounded one, but more to defend Rathalos from the accusation of him constantly sucking. 
And as well, Rathalos is aggressive, apparently even by monster standards, seeing other large monsters in his territory as invaders to be repelled. Whilst most of the Apex level monsters are also highly aggressive, considering the most fierce ones are often ones suffering from seasonal hormonal influxes or mutations, the fact Rathalos is almost up there with them is pretty impressive. The quest in the first game occurs because one nesting near Kotoko village literally wiped out a platoon as well. Rathalos is probably the most common powerful flying wyvern with the widest distribution in the old world, and you can't really be a true king in the minds of the people if you're only sighted once every nine years. People living in Moga or Kotoko village have probably never seen an elder dragon or basil juice, whereas Rathalos are resident in these areas and can probably even be seen from the village flying overhead on a clear day. From this, Rathalos likely has a much stronger cultural grounding in the native civilizations of the old world, and this, with his still notable power, is likely what led to his title. Overall, with additional behaviours added in world, I feel Rathalos comes across as a cunning, capable and powerful fighter who especially uses his aerial mobility to dominate land-based opponents. And if you're still unconvinced, then there's Silver Rathalos, who is apparently Elder Dragon tier. To move on to briefly discussing the various colours of Wraths, there's not much science you can really try to blag here to be honest, other than maybe human cultures and black art hunters may well exaggerate the capabilities of unique animals, and that Silver Rathalos are pretty rare. But there's no real justification for a Silver Rathalos being more powerful. There's seemingly little advantage for a Rathalos to be silver as well, or indeed for a Rathian to be gold. So it seems these may just be genetic quirks that may even be disadvantageous and ultimately explain the rarity. Far more common are Azure Rathalos and Pink Rathian, which seem associated with volcanic areas and arid areas. These colours do a lot better at blending in, the blue with the dark volcanic rocks and the pink with the sands of the desert. It's better than being green at least. Whilst Rathalos's typical aerial attacks probably don't require much camouflage other than being countershaded, which he is anyway, this may still be more important when young, to avoid competitors and to rest in peace. In real life leopards we see something similar. In the deep rainforests of certain parts of the Malay Peninsula, melanistic leopards significantly outnumber spotted ones. In such an environment, melanistic leopards have the advantage, and have become far more common due to such individuals being selected for in this population. It's also been suggested it helps them avoid tigers, which could give further support that Azure Rathalos's unique coloration is more to help reduce predation or competition. Azure Rathalos may not be as overall prevalent as melanism in this population of leopards though for a few reasons. The leopard population mentioned is partially cut off and so has little incoming gene flow, whereas Rathalos can fly so gene flow isn't really a problem. Secondly, if Rathian can't nest in volcanic areas only near to them, then this will limit selection effects, as there won't be the same pressure to adapt to the environment if they're not truly resident there. It can also explain why Azure Rathalos are still seen more in land and why regular Red Rathalos can still be occasionally be found in volcanoes. To discuss Dread King and Dread Queen individuals, the key thing that sets them apart is the incredibly distinctive patterns on the wings. Like many ornate structures in modern animals, like a lion's mane, a bird's plumage, or the coloration, these could show physical fitness and condition in the separate genders. When we look at various animal species, they can also show greater testosterone, lower parasite loads, stronger immune responses, and social dominance. So individuals known as Dread King and Queen may well just be the cream of the crop when it comes to Rathalos and Rath the strongest and fittest individuals of a population that were translated into them being the deadliest to hunt. With the science done, I also like to have a small bit at the end just to discuss the animals in question overall. And overall I really do like both Rathalos and Rathian, and think Rathalos is a pretty good flagship for the overall series. Whilst relatively generic as dragons or wyverns, they both have quite a nice design, with elements of eagle being mixed into the overall wyvern, and the sexual dimorphism showed from the very beginning that Monster Hunter was a franchise that treated its beasts differently. I guess in hindsight I do wish they'd taken the dimorphism a bit further, and the differences in the fight in the initial games, but it's a bit late for that now really, and it was definitely changed as the franchise progressed. I also especially like Rathalos's implementation in World as well, where he really did feel like a top predator of the ancient forest, and with a lot of very natural feeling moves in his updated fight as well. 
I think all of the Apexes in their respective environments got a pretty solid deal in Base World. It's a pretty big step up too, considering what a complete and utter ball ache he was to fight prior to 3rd gen. Rathian, on the other hand, has always been a pretty decent fight, and one of my favourite monsters to train against in the series. I think the theme for both is great, even if they never got it properly tied to them like the other flagships, and Fatalis also partially stole Rathalos's. Some do complain that Rathalos has been in the series too much and they'd like a game without him, but overall I'm quite happy for him to stay. And to be honest, I don't actually mind a lot of the monsters returning to beef out current rosters. So thanks for watching. This is a new series in which I'll be trying to use various fictitious beasts as conduits to provide what I hope are educative and interesting videos about the natural world. The main thrust of this will indeed be regarding Monster Hunter, but not all, and I have several other videos planned on other series and other monsters too. If you've enjoyed what you saw here today, please consider liking, subscribing and sharing it with others who may also enjoy it. It's hard to say how well this series may do, as there may well be some unpopular hot takes on popular monsters. Unlike other channels, who consider everything canon and work up from that, some of the more unapologetically stupid and ridiculous aspects of monsters are definitely going to be taken apart. Some of the boys in later gens are not going to come off well at all. But with that said, certain aspects will be ignored. Rathalos would obviously never be able to fly in real life, but he was given large well-connected wings that are enough to suspend disbelief. So some aspects of physiology that the series wouldn't be able to work without or exist purely for gameplay will generally be ignored, or at least swept under the rug. But if there are things you'd like to learn more about, your own theories or questions you've always had about various monsters, or other franchises you'd like to suggest for me to look into, or even facts about real life animals you think are applicable, don't hesitate to suggest them. This channel will only get stronger the more suggestions come in, as there's one person doing it all, there is a lot that I can still miss. So once again, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time hopefully, and here's a teaser for the next video.